Houstonian, and Shannon is a builder and a native Vermonter. So what we're going to be talking about tonight is basically our story of Houston and how we're interacting with it now, how, um, what our history is with it, and by telling you our story, hopefully you'll get a better picture of what's going on in Houston and um, with everyone who's living there. So we got a lot to throw at you. There's a lot of can of worms that we're probably going to open. We're going to, go, you know, we're going to get through a lot, hopefully fairly quickly, and then we're totally open to questions and answers for as long as you want. So anything that we don't get into deep enough, feel free to bombard us at the end. Okay. So the first thing we want to get into again is our, our personal histories because that has a lot to do with what we're doing, which, as you'll find out, might be on the verge of craziness. Um, but so me first, this is my family history basically. My parents are actually not from Houston. I'm actually not truly a native Texan by the same way that a Vermonter is not truly a Vermonter unless they're born in Vermont and probably have generations of Vermonters behind them. But I actually wasn't even born in Texas. Um, my parents are from Denver. My father grew up pumping gas at his father's gas station. And I think somewhere along the way, he figured that it would be better to be the guy finding oil than the guy changing it. So he became a geophysicist, went to work for Exxon right out of school. They, my parents eloped to Seattle, that's where he started with Exxon. He was transferred to Los Angeles where my brother and I were born. That's not me. That's not my father, but that's all my parents. <laughs> they move people a lot and my dad told them that he would go anywhere in the world but Texas so they said okay you're going to Houston so when I was six months old off to Houston we went and there you go uh, spin the top 1901 probably a, a, something an image that we think of when we think of Houston the oil capital of the world so we moved here only this is the view of it in 1953, so I'm cheating a little bit. This was the first home we moved into. There is a pointer here, I check. This is the first home, and this is where our second home was. We lived here for five years, and then there my parents still live in this location. What you see here, this is the Buffalo Bayou. This is the waterway that Houston was founded upon, which you'll see in a little bit. Um, one thing about this, you see these are very long, pieces of land. Houston was one of the first areas to be settled and it was settled under the Spanish land system, not the Jeffersonian grid. So these are called leagues of land. They're very long and they usually come up to a body of water often. So this is kind of the landscape along the bayou. You start to see a little Jeffersonian grid come in here a little bit. Okay. Now the other thing I want to point out is that this is prairie ecology here what our ecologists like to call um, prairie potholes and pimple mounds. So you can see right here, we're right on them. And here's a close-up view of that first home site, again, 1953. But here's what it looked like. This was four years, 1978, four years after we moved out. So when I lived there, none of this was here yet. It was just us, our little island. And not much. We were in the boonies. This ball field was there. This was our house. It was, about, it was about a thousand square foot house. Small. This road right here was actually a dead end and that's where we had all our community block parties. And right at the end of that road was our community tree house. And this was our wilderness playground. It was wild. No one was tending it. And there were tarantulas and rattlesnakes and you name it. All sorts of fun to be had. So that was my first five years. And to put this into context for you, this is the city of Houston. Again, we're still in 1953. Um, you can see right there, that's the downtown area. So look where we are. This is the Buffalo Bayou, which comes right through downtown and continues to Galveston Bay. So looking a little closer at downtown and with the overlay of the current system, as we go through this, keep in mind, this will be a good landmark for you. This is Loop 610, or the inner loop. So you'll be able to kind of tell what's going on over time by keeping an eye on that. This is downtown. It's kind of an inner, inner loop. It is the 
completely surrounded by elevated freeways. This is the region. So a quick thing about this, you can't see it very well, but this is Galveston Bay. Here's Galveston Island. Here's Beaumont where Spindle Top was. Um, most people don't realize, or I don't think, or think of Houston as a port city, but it is. That's why I was founded as a port city. But in the 19th century, Galveston was the major port. And it was one of the largest in the world. It was very wealthy. But two things happened at the turn of the 20th century that changed that. The 1900 storm hurricane wiped out the island. There was already a shallow port to Houston, but that got everyone thinking, all right, we need to move the port farther inland. And so they did. And it was actually funded, partially funded with federal dollars. So they widened, they dredged the uh, Buffalo Bayou as it came towards downtown. And that is now the Houston Ship Channel. The other thing that changed the fate of what was going on here was, of course, the Spindle Top in 1901. But I want to point out that Houston was there prior to all that. Its economy was in railroad and timber. So it was, you know, it, and it had served as the capital of Texas for a short period of time. So it's not like it, it came into existence because of oil. It was already there. So here's the ecology of the area. And if anyone is a permaculturist, um, the thing to note here is it's an edge condition. So we've got the piney forest ecology coming down from the northeast, and then coastal prairies coming up from the coast. And now you can see the Galveston Bay better. Between two rivers, and then a lot of water, a lot of bayous coming down and through there. Lots of water and flat. The one thing um, I we listened a little bit to Regenerative earlier this week, they're doing a class here right now, and one of the things that Bill mentioned, Bill Reed, was that what they're finding is that the ecology, the story of ecology of a place very often is matching, or always is matching, the social story of a place. And that's probably, you know, you can see that in Houston. We have an extremely diverse ecology and an edge condition, and we also have a very diverse population. 90 languages are spoken in the city of Houston. It's the most diverse city in this country. <coughs> All right, so back to my two homes now, now that you know a little bit better where they are. So we're going to go through a quick time lapse so you can see what happened over time. And I'll try and point out a couple of things here. Let's go back to here. So here we are. The first thing is, um, this shocked me, the first thing that showed up was a golf course. Build it and they will come. That was pretty shocking to me. So we're 1989, 1995, 2002. And look at this thing that just showed up over here. This is the second loop around Houston. So 2014. My parents still live here. So we started with that one loop. In early 2000, the second loop was built. We are now largely through construction of the third outer rim. That's how much the city is expanding. And there was a lot of um, probably ecologically minded people fighting that third rim because it's going through basically some prairie land and there's really no subdivisions there yet. So like, what is this serving? You'll see later one of the things that it's serving. Um, so here's kind of my childhood territory. Home, ice rinks, I played hockey and gymnastics. I was a competitive gymnast growing up. So this distance is when I drove to high school every day. That's about an hour drive in traffic. Yes, this is, you learn early how to do Houston. I know, that's your shot, yes. Hour drive in traffic. And then I had to come all the way down here along 59 to gymnastics. That was, this was my every single day. This wasn't on weekends, this is every single day. Here's my high school. So I went to Robert E. Lee High School. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you would be entertained by that. Um, it was built in 1962. And for the first, you know, oh, not quite 20 years, it was pretty much 100% white. And it was built, you know, affluent white, upper middle class white. Um, the Civil War was, you know, basically celebrated. There were pictures of Robert E. Lee in the hallways and they flew the Confederate flag. When I got there in 1984, that culture had not changed, but the demographic had 50% white. And this bothered me. 
it bothered me a lot. Just flying the Confederate flag, frankly, bothers me. And so I'm at a school that's 50% minority, and none of those kids are in my classes because I'm in honor classes. That's the first thing. And none of them are in any of the culture of the school other than athletics. And we're flying the Confederate flag. So I'm disturbed. I'm really disturbed. And really social justice issues really kind of became a passion for me at that time. And I won't tell you about some of the shenanigans that I got into the student council. Um, another story. Ask me about it later if you want to hear about it. Um, but I decided for college I wanted to get as far away from Houston and Texas as I could, and I did. So I went to Princeton and proceeded to study why these things are the way that they are. And I knew I wanted to be an architect, so I was an architect major, but I took urban classes in every department I could possibly, any department that was offered in, whether it was sociology, economics, religion, you name it, I was taking it. After I graduated from Princeton, I went back to Texas because I had a job to work as an urban planner for the city of Galveston, which is a microcosm basically of Houston. It's very interesting, so you get everything in a really concentrated, focused way. So I did that for a couple of years, realized that I wasn't going to be able to affect the change that I wanted fast enough or the way that I wanted to just by being an urban planner. You needed the designer, you needed the developer, you needed everyone in this picture, and so I'm like, all right, what do I do with that? So the first thing I thought is, well, I'll go back to graduate school and I'll get a joint degree in urban planning and architecture. I'll just start to learn it all. So I applied to schools back east, but ultimately I stayed in Houston and went to Rice because that's the lab. They were actually doing this to their school of architecture. They were really interested in these issues and trying to do it in an integrated way, and that ended up being a great decision for me. Um, I got introduced to systems theory while I was there, and I returned to something that had gotten lost. Now you're going to ask, where does this come from? This is Mesa Verde, I'm sure you're familiar with it. Um, so I have to go back to my family history a little bit. My grandfather did not start out in the oil business. He started out as a mountain guide in the Rockies as a young man. Um, it, this legend has it. It took the governor of Colorado himself to get my grandfather to come down out of the mountains. He served as his mountain guide, and the governor convinced him to come be his chauffeur. So my grandfather ended up being his chauffeur for the governor of Colorado, and that's how he got into the oil business, so to speak. He went from there to owning a gas station, and you've heard the rest of that story. But my point here is we're really, my family, we're displaced mountain people. And so, Every summer we would go to Colorado and go camping, and we'd drive through New Mexico, work our way up, spend a lot of time in the Durango area, and work our way up to my grandparents. So I saw Mesa Verde as pretty young, when I was about eight, um, and we'd drive up into all the old ghost towns and you name it, whatnot, and I was just fascinated by that, and that's what inspired me to be an architect, which is kind of unusual in and of itself, but what caught me about this was the integration between the built environment and the natural environment, the so-called man-made and the natural, which as I was studying that, coming back around to it at Rice, was like, this is kind of bull. There's not man-made and natural because you can't divorce man-made from natural. And so I was really working with that a lot as I worked on my thesis, which was on, on settlement patterns. So, that's kind of my history. I then went to work as an architect for a mid-sized firm in Houston for 15 years, and all that went away again, because I'm now just learning how to build buildings and learning kind of the lay of the land and what's going on with this. Why are, why are we doing what we're doing? And that experiment took a little longer than I anticipated, <laughs> um, but I wasn't really thinking ecologically. No one in Houston was until this client. This is the Monarch School. It's a school for kids with neurological differences in Houston. It's a world-renowned school. People move there from all over the world for their kids to get help. They've developed their own curriculum, you know, that's, which is not uncommon with, with these autism because it's not something that everyone's just figured out some standard way to do it. But what I learned with them is that you can't separate development from the environment. And that's what they had learned. So if you think about someone with autism, they're having connectivity issues of some sort. So somewhere in their development, they basically have stalled. And 
they either haven't fully differentiated, differentiated from the environment, or they haven't figured out how they relate back to it and to the people around them. So what they found there is that they've got to deal with those issues. They first have to kind of reduce stimuli in order to allow them to kind of open up to develop. They have to figure out each kid individually because that everyone's different. And then once they allow them to start that, restart that differentiation process, who am I, then it's who am I in relationship to the world. And so what came out of this is these are all, these are three of the buildings on campus. I designed all of this. There was a new campus for them. Um, none of them were designed to be lead, but they all ended up being lead gold buildings. And particularly fell right in line with the lead for schools program, not because they were particularly interested in that, but because they had to do those things. It wasn't optional to do those things. And that, you know, I, with lead, I had kind of been, eh, I'm not really inspired by it up until that point. And at this point, I'm like, well, you know, there's a deeper thing going on here. There's a deeper meaning that we really need to start to think about. So this is my jumping off point where I started to shift. And that said, I'm going to shift this story to Shannon. <laughs> <laughs> I just side note, uh, when I moved down to Texas, Shelly didn't even recycle. <laughs> True. So uh, uh, that's kind of where we started thinking about reuse and repurpose and all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm a native Vermonter, and this is where I grew up. Um, it's interesting to kind of compare stories uh, of how we grew up and, and, and what we did when we grew up. Uh, my mom's home was here, and my dad's home was there. So they grew up a town apart, and they went to the same high school. My mom's home was in Leicester, Vermont, and my dad's home was in Goshen, Vermont. He was a, um, he was a kid of 12 in his family. Uh, my mom was one of three. Uh, they went to the same high school. And then, my home was here, really not too far away from there. But we, I traveled to school here, the, I call it the family high school because generations of my family went to this high school. And we were taught by the same teachers. Um, so, you know, so when I got the history and I said, mom, did you have Mr. So-and-so? She said, oh yeah, does he still sit on the desk and swing his legs? Yes, he does. <laughs> okay. um, so. That's just, this, this is an interesting thing to go to the same high school as your parents and as their parents and what have you. Um, kind of my travel route was from my home to my high school, back to my home because I had a sister and she needed a way back and um, I would take her back. And then I would go to hockey there and back. So it turns out that my traveling in mileage was a greater distance than Shelley's in in just in her city, uh, but her her commute took longer than mine. Um, so this is the the uh, camp that my parents uh, bought when I was about twelve years old, and it was a little camp on a lake. It wasn't winterized, uh, just a little one story little camp that they got from a friend. And I come from a family of builders, so you name it, we got it in my family. But remember, my dad's from a family of 12, so we had, you know, the roofer, the electrician, the plumber, the framer, the blah, 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 you know, like, they know how to do it all, right? <laughs> so, um, and we renovated our, our house in, in, in town, and then, and then we bought this little place, and my parents' dream was to live on the lake. It's on a little lake. And it was still, we didn't have to move schools. Um, so their dream was, well, by the time Shannon can drive, that's going to be a winterized home, and we're all going to be able to live in it. So they built up and over, and not much up and not much over. Okay, so they built this here. I should say we, because I, I built two. They built this. This was the master bedroom, and it had a bathroom up top. Very simple. They put a deck on it. And then they built this. And this was a little small 
bedroom for my sister and I with a loft in it. And there were many fights about who got the loft, because the loft was more private, because there was no other way to get up in the loft but to go down and go through the person's room in the, in the downstairs. So this is what this is how we grew up. We got to swim, we got to play sports, we got to run in the woods, we got to build cabins. We were always outside, always outside. This lake has one, two, three, four islands on it. And we explored every one of them and every inch of it. We went to the bathroom on it because they didn't have a bathroom, but we had already canoed out there. So what were we going to do, right? We swam out to this island and back. We had all sorts of fun. We were always in nature, always exploring things. The other great thing is we didn't have to worry about tarantulas or rattlesnakes. <laughs> so then, well, I went to school, I went to Brown, and I studied organizational behavior management, and I played ice hockey. And my whole school was white, except for one kid. Because we had one kid that wasn't white. That's it. Now, my high school, it was seven towns, it included seven towns in one high school, and it was grades seven through twelve, and my graduating class was about a hundred. Okay. Um, so I came back to Vermont, and then I got an opportunity in Washington State, right around Seattle. So I got to uh, raise sailboats on the Puget Sound, I got to climb real mountains, <laughs> not the hills of Vermont, okay? and I did a lot of outdoor things there too. And then I got the opportunity to go to upstate New York. And there wasn't a whole lot going on in upstate New York, but there was a college uh, ice hockey coaching job that I took. And so I coached college ice hockey, but more importantly, I bought my first house in New York in a little hamlet called Poolville. I didn't even know what a hamlet was. I didn't even know there was a word for that. It was a little hamlet, and I proceeded to renovate that house. It's on a little stream. I loved it. And then I got a job, a better coaching job, in western Massachusetts. And I was like, well, that's closer to home. And it looks a lot like where I grew up. And so I want to go here. And I did. And I coached some hockey, but I mostly explored the Berkshires with my dog. Because that was really fun. And I wanted to be in their nature. I loved it. It centered me. It grounded me. Then I ended up here, and my parents were like, what? You're going to Houston? And I said, yeah. And, and the, the sayings, everything is bigger in Texas, it's true. I mean, if you've never been there, it's, it's true. And they take on this mentality, don't mess with Texas. Okay, they, this was, a, this was an, an advertisement for, uh, for glitter. That's where this, this saying came from. And what they were trying to tell fellow Texans was, don't litter, because then you'll have to, we'll have to take care of you, and you know, don't mess with Texas. And then they, they're taking that on, very like independent, proud, sturdy kind of people. Um, actually, not so much different than Vermonters is what I found. Okay, friendly too. They also think Texas is this much of the United States. <laughs> And I can mean, I mean, mess with that now. Um, but just to give you a sense of kind of, you know, this is the sort of like, the, the kind of the people. And that's what I do every day. Wherever you go, all the time, traffic. It's exhausting. Can we talk about those three loops? Whew. It's like that a lot of the time. And it's really tiring. And I discovered that that was nature in the city of Houston. Now we have an arboretum, and we have some green parks. Okay, but nature as it wants to be, it's found between the concrete or the pavement. And that's deeply concerning to me and my energy levels. And I found it really tough. Not only was the traffic exhausting, but I couldn't actually find my, my center. I couldn't find my groundedness 
in the back. Okay, so I just want to go back here real quick. I wanted to find the, the, the song, but I couldn't find it. But Counting Crows did this song called Big Yellow Taxi. And I, I'm not going to sing it. I want to show you guys with that. But it says they took all the trees and they put them in a tree museum. And then they charged the people a dollar and a half to see them. Right? They paved paradise and they put up a parking lot. Mm -hmm. Okay? And Houston has done it. They have paved everything that they can. Then I met this guy. So I went down there thinking, I'm either going to be a chef or I'm going to be a builder. I got to reinvent myself in my early 30s. And you can just tell by the grin on that guy's face, he's trouble. Okay? He is a college professor just in a, in a town just north of where, where I live. Um, and he's an artist, and he's also a self-taught builder. So he started this company called the Phoenix Commotion, and they mostly build out of salvage material. And they build for low-income people, and they build for single parents, single dads, and single moms um, in his own community. And people know about him around the world, and he's been offered to do this sort of thing around the world. And he doesn't want to do it anywhere but his own community. And he's making some tremendous progress. So then I met him, and then I found myself there, on top of one of the roofs that uh, we were doing a building. And it kind of reminded me of my childhood, <laughs> because that's me. And this is the old house, the old camp, with the second floor. And that was me going, yeah, I like this stuff. It's a lot of fun. So I got to do, this is called the Bone House, uh, with the Phoenix Commotion. And we built mostly out of salvage. This was a three bedroom studio for our artists. And we played around with things like uh, wood mosaic floors. Um, those are all little pieces of different, different kinds of woods that we put together. Um, and I found authenticity in my work. This here is, uh, we did a lot of mosaic stuff. Bottle caps, yep, you can make a floor out of them. Beer bottle labels, yep, paper mache floor, you can make, make a floor out of them. And they're durable too. Wine corks, sure, why not? This is the wine cork floor right here. And it's really nice to step on. Um, so I was learning how to be creative with materials that people usually threw in the landfill. And then I got to design this outdoor kitchen which was really fun. Dan said, there are some bottles. Go design an outdoor kitchen. And so I got to just do that. And now I think I can kind of call myself an artist. This was a little building we did for a, a recycle center. And my co-worker did this whole sculpture. And he got everything off the ground. It's a scrap metal place. There's a great advertisement for them, too. So what I realized in working with Dan is that I can reuse and repurpose material and that impacts how much stuff goes into the landfill. And then that ultimately impacts the planet. Okay, because it's amazing what the, the construction industry throws away and it's usable. It's, it's incredible. Uh, oh, this window doesn't quite fit. Well, I guess it's going to the landfill. Oh, these cutoffs, what are we going to do with them? They're just, you know, one foot, two foot. It goes in the landfill. Okay? So we're taking up an awful lot of space, the construction industry, uh, trying to uh, get rid of our, our waste. So also, uh, that mentorship helped me realize how I could make a difference um, in people's lives. So what we did was we started, well we can talk about this later, but we started the, our design build company called Ten Building. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, so you want to start this up? Yeah, we'll do this list here and have a kind of video together here. So um, that, those <coughs> three years that Shannon was working for Phoenix Promotion, and I was still at the firm that I was at, we started doing some soul searching because things just weren't sitting right with us. So this is a look at everything we did in those three years. <laughs> And it's pretty much all over the map, um, basically following anything that was of interest to us. You can see permaculture design certificate was in there, cob building. We'll go 
through some of these things. Um, okay. Yeah, we gotta, we gotta catch up here. So we're gonna just move through these quickly. Um, here's a student permaculture design certificate. This is doing environmental restoration on one of the creeks in town. Um, this is at a, at a permaculture farm west of Houston and the design project out there. This is us then, all right, starting at home. What do we do, you know, if we're gonna do this in the world, we better start with ourselves. So yes, I did learn how to recycle and compost the whole nine yards. Um, we turned our front yard, which used to look like this, and we had to get rid of this tree into a farm. And that's been an interesting experiment with our neighbors. Uh, the tree had to go, um, and all the, the front yards in our neighborhood look the same. And most everybody hires a lawn service to take care of them. So we right now we can uh, cut our grass uh, with a battery operated uh, trimmer. We don't need a more, more. <laughs> which is nice. This is a um, flying concrete workshop. We're just going to keep flying through this. Cob, we went to Cobb Cottage in Oregon, did a cob building workshop. And then uh, we met some people at Cobb Cottage who had some land in New Mexico and they wanted to build, get a bunch of us back together to build a Cobb house on their property. And so they asked me to help design it. There was an existing or that, uh, octagonal slot, uh, slab, concrete slab, so we started with that. But I had never done any passive design before. I had not been anything that we do in Houston. So I put every passive thing I could possibly put into this thing to experiment with it. And here we are building it. Um, they're doing the final phase actually this summer. We spent two summer, two, we went two summers, spent about a week there each time with you know, this cast of characters. And then we came back to the Monarch School and Shannon taught natural building at the Monarch School. So you know, here we are, these kids, these are all kids with some sort of neurological difference who don't like touching things working with cod, which was really therapeutic. And, and look at the kid's face up in the corner. It's <laughs> he is psyched. He is so psyched. And uh, it's a whole other presentation to talk about how um, kids with autism touching the earth and reconnecting with the earth, how that helps them, but it helps all of us. And we saw it substantially in this class that I taught here. So um, that then led to two things happening. The first is that Monarch School was familiar with Phoenix Commotion's work and knew Shannon worked there. She was doing this. And they, there were five studio buildings that we had planned, master planned for their site. And they wanted the first one to be a la Phoenix Commotion. So they asked Shannon if she would get, find out if Dan would be interested in doing it. And so she went to Dan and said, you interested in doing the studio? He said, no, I think you should do it. I think you should start your own company. And so we looked at each other like, uh, really? Uh, okay. And we really thought about it and said, why not? Yeah, okay, we'll do that. So we first took that. That was the first part of our week. It was in the plans, but not that quickly, by any stretch. And the second thing, that we, we started that project. And we'll get into the Living Building Challenge aspects of it later. It became a Living Building Challenge project. Um, but with that project was in design at my old firm. I was designing it, and in designing it, I'm designing this project that's going for Living Building Challenge, which is you know the top of the echelon of green buildings. And I noticed that really not many other people in the company were really interested in what I was doing. And I'm like, okay, you know, my purpose at this point, having done all of this other kind of soul searching and really getting clear on what is and who I am and who I want to be in relationship to that. And I just realized if I stay here, even though I was trying to change that culture, I'm always going, my limit is always going to be what their purpose is as a firm, which is business as usual. And I wasn't okay with that. So the second thing that happened is about Six months or so after we started our design build company, Tim Building, to build the studio, we founded the company to build the studio. I said, forget it, I'm going to start my own architecture firm too. And I was terrified. I mean, we're terrified. Like, we're stepping out into a void. You know, we're, we don't know if we're going to be able to make ends meet. We don't know any of that. We don't know if this is going to work or not. But we have some real heart to hearts. Like, the worst thing that could happen is we're going to have to sell everything and move back to Vermont. Okay, we'll do it. It's <laughs> not a problem. So here I am packing up and moving out of the office. And it gave us, yeah, and it gave us an opportunity to um, to really look in the face and say, 
we dare, we're going to dare to fail spectacularly. You know, we, we're going to do it. And, and we don't know what's going to happen. So we, just, we still don't know what's going to happen. So, on this journey. Right. And, yeah, I think that, that willingness to fail is big. And that's, you know, you're looking at two overachievers who've been very successful in everything we've ever done. And to be like, okay, I'm willing to really fall flat on my face is a big deal. But uh, so far, so far so good. But we're still okay with it. All right, so let's talk about what is this thing, the belly of the beast. And I just want to say quickly that this phrase comes from a remonter. We were visiting with friends with Meta Earth Institute, which is just in Lincoln. If anyone's familiar with that, we're meeting, uh, sitting down with Jillian over there one day and telling her about, just as we were launching all this, what we're doing, and she's just looking at us with eyes wide open, like, oh my gosh, I just, what, how are you doing this in the belly of the beast? And we just looked at her like, oh my, I, we knew we were crazy, but we didn't quite know we were that crazy. But, so that's where the kind of putting that label on it comes from, but it really brought us kind of like to, to face with, you know, what it was we were up against. So let's look at what we're up against. So this is the, this is the lovely picture of the port of Houston. Doesn't that look lovely? It's like a postcard. This is the entry, beautiful bridge, blue waters, sunset, Houston in the background. Here's the original plan for Houston. This is the Buffalo Bayou then coming out to, this is looking south, coming out to Galveston Bay, um, lovely. Uh, down here, well, let's, I'll come back to that. Look at this. This Houston is the second largest port in the country. It's the first in foreign tonnage. Okay, so you may not be aware of that, but that's this is a huge deal. Okay, this map over here is a Bayou Greenways project that recently got approved by the voters in Houston. And so what this is is they're greening, going back and creating hike bike trails along all the bayous. Notice what happens, here's downtown right in here. Notice what happens here. No more greenways. So this interesting thing happened when they dredged out Buffalo Bayou. They changed its name to the Houston Ship Channel. This is the Buffalo Bayou, but it ceases being the Buffalo Bayou once it gets to here. And that's because this is the reality of the Houston ship chair. This is what it really looks like. This is a scene that Houstonians do not see. Visitors do not see. Visitors who think they're coming to see, no one sees that. I mean, even I've never seen that. It's crazy. This is, this is what's really there. And, and you don't see this because it's way on the east side of downtown. We all live on the other side. So the only people who see this are the people who work there and the people who live there. There are people who live there. So this right here, this was taken a picture a couple months ago. This is a ship illegally dumping diesel fuel into the ship channel. And this happens all the time. So forget that blue water stuff. This is the reality. And these are refineries. This refinery is completely surrounding Galveston Bay. And a lot of the Gulf Coast shores as well. You see this in Louisiana as well. Not, not as concentrated as this. So what's this? These look like images you probably have all seen from the BP accident, but this is not the BP accident. This happened three months ago in Galveston Bay, and you probably didn't hear about it. This was an oil tanker that collided with a barge, 170,000 gallons of oil into the bay. This is it washing up onto Galveston Island beaches. This is a dead bird, obviously. There it is. Here's the interesting thing. Whoa. So, you know, the only time our attention is called to this when there's a disaster on the magnitude of the BP one. But it's happening all the time. And look at this. This is hysterical. It's not hysterical. It's, it's comical, but not hysterical. Um, at the same, while they were cleaning this up, there was 160 gallons spill at the same time. One of those daily things that kind of happens. That, you know, but I can tell you, most Houstonians probably weren't even aware of this. Those people who were walking on the beach were. But unless you happen to catch it briefly on the news, probably didn't hear about it. 
which is why Houston is ground zero for the environmental justice movement. And has anyone heard that term before, environmental justice? No. One, two, some. Okay. So this man right here is Dr. Robert Bullard. He is the dean of the Texas Southern University Public Policy Urban Planning Department. He wrote this book, Invisible Houston, in the 70s, when these issues first started coming up, which bring to life that low-income people of color usually are more susceptible to climate change and these pollution environmental factors than everybody else. And there's the data to kind of prove that. That's what this book is about. Here he is right there at the signing of the Environmental Justice Executive Order in 1994, President Clinton. I don't know how much that's really done, but he is kind of the founder of this movement and it's still very strong. And here's the reason why it's strong in Houston. I talked about people living in the midst of this. Here they are. This is their neighborhood and that's a refinery. This is a playground and there's a flare right there. There's another one, the same thing. They're practicing football. And these people are the ones fighting it. Houston has never been in compliance with the Clean Air Act. So much for that. Mm. These types of groups are suing the EPA and have made a lot of headway in doing so. There's changes hopefully coming soon. But, um, you know, this is, this is kind of the ground. And, and I think one of the things that Shannon and I wanted to kind of point out that we're all part of this. You know, it's invisible even to us in Houston, but if you live in Vermont, this is invisible stuff. You don't know this is going on. But we're all part of it. Our, it's ingrained. Our whole culture is built on the petrochemical industry. You can, you know, even if you've done a really great job of, of diminishing it, it's still our culture. And so we're all responsible. So this is what we're trying to show up to. All right, so that's just what the challenges have been. Here are the stressors. This lovely thing, the Keystone Pipeline. Um, you know, everyone's kind of, I think a lot of people on, on the um, ecological side of things are, are up in arms about it because of the climate change issue. These farmers, Texas farmers, are mad about it for other reasons. And in spite of all of their fighting, imminent domain was used for this pipeline to come across their property, and you can see these fighting. Um, it's in. The southern portion is in, and it's operating. It's operating, and this is where it goes to, Houston. Okay, and what it's bringing are, well, eventually, possibly the tar sand oil, but for now, fracked. And both of those are highly, much more toxic than conventionally drilled oil. They're toxic just in and of themselves. Like they're toxic just to be exposed to them, we know that. But when you now start to refine them, we're already not in compliance with the Clean Air Act, and refineries are gonna be expanding, uh, so you you know you see where this is going. And then what's this? Mm -hmm. Panama Canal expansion. Our port's gonna be expanding because of this. And not only that, so we're getting more traffic, but um, I think one of the industries that will now be coming through is they're going to be training coal in from the Rockies now to, into Houston. They're going to process it there, dirty, and then get it to new markets through the Panama Canal. So there's that. And then there's this. <coughs> this is ExxonMobil's new campus. So Houston has always been the oil capital of the world, but these companies are massive, they're huge, they're dispersed, they're everywhere. Um, a lot of kind of recentralization seems to be happening, so Exxon, when they've merged with Mobile, they have offices in Fairfax, they're, they're closing down Fairfax, Virginia, and moving everyone to Houston. This is 10,000 jobs. I think there's other places they're bringing them in from. My brother and sister-in-law have been with Exxon for 25 years, or among those people. Um, and this is a uh, lovely, you know, this is designed by Gensler. And let me say this, Gensler has great sustainability department with really high-minded people who are guiding this process. And yet, this is in the Piney Forest on the north side of town. And this is what has to happen in order for this office to move in, okay? 
That's the view of it, aerial view of it. And you know, before it was build a golf course and they will come. Now you build the parking garage and they will come. And then you camouflage it so we can't see it. You see, this is a camouflage group that cracks me up. Um, the other thing you have to build for them to come is big roads. So that third loop I was talking about, the third outer beltway that everyone's like, why are you building that no one lives out there? There's Exxon. This is the north side of it. Third loop. Okay. Okay, so, so it's about to get really fun because that's really disgusting. <laughs> so what we're doing down there, there is we're doing down there is we're planting seeds, right? And um, we got an opportunity to uh, ask the Monarch School if they wanted to make one of their studios a living building challenge studio. And before they even knew what that was, they said yes. <laughs> because they're visionaries. Okay? And they said, well, he said, well, even if that means you're gonna have to go from five studios to maybe four, and they said, yes, because it's the right thing to do, because we want to be an example for the people of Houston and other people coming into this town, and we want to do it, we'll make it happen. And yeah, let me kind of just say that if you're not aware of this, autism is epidemic in this country. And so it's one of the things that I didn't say about the Monarch School that's interesting is you have to get rid of all of these, you have to get rid of VOCs, you've got to get rid of everything that could be toxic in the building for them to start to develop their students. And so it seems to me like if we're moving those things, then it enables them to develop, that probably there's a correlation somewhere in there. But the difference between people with neurological differences and neurotypicals is that we adapt, you know, or seemingly. Like, you know, we could be in a room that just got painted with horrible VOCs and we'll get, you know, five minutes we're not smelling it. These guys are out of there. They can't be there. Now, I may get a headache because of it, but if I've stopped smelling it, I may not even remember why I have a headache. Or maybe 20 years later, if you've got cancer, you have no idea what you were exposed to as to what happened. But with kids with autism, their systems are telling them. And so in a lot of ways, it's a gift. And this is a really strange way of thinking about it, but they're reflecting something back to us that's really helpful. And so rather than marginalize what they're learning there, it's about learning like, hey, what is this telling us? And how do we then apply that to not only just education with all students, but what we're doing with our buildings and in the world in general? Which is why they don't send yes to this, because they realize they're trying to truly solve these problems. So the Living Building Challenge, I'm going to read it because it's just easier, is the built environment's most rigorous performance standard. It calls for the creation of building projects at all scales that operate as cleanly, beautifully, and efficiently as nature's architecture. Okay, and so they have imperatives and you have to meet them. Um, and so the imperatives are net zero water, net zero energy, there are site imperatives, like where you can build and, and scalability. There's a red list, so you don't put formaldehyde in a building, you don't put things you can't pronounce in a building that are making us sick and killing us. There are health, um, Health and health and well-being imperatives, and then there's beauty and inspiration. Okay, mm -hmm. the building can't just you know it has to be inspiring. It has to be beautiful, and we know that that's a that's a subjective thing. And then equity. Okay, so it has to people of, of all types have to be able to access it. So we went about this, and we were the first project to attempt the Living Building Challenge in Texas. Um, it has a, you have to show that you meet the challenge through a one year performance period. So you don't just check off a list and you made it. So through one year, the students will run this building and they'll show that we've met all those imperatives. So what we did was we did an integrated design process. We brought all the stakeholders to the table. We met, uh, I think it was over four months, about six or seven times uh, to talk about how we're gonna build this building, and this was the design that came out of it. And during that process, we threw no budget, 
Take the budget away. What's the potential of this building? Okay, what's the true potential? What's it going to be used for? And then we'll come back to the table and talk about money. Okay. So that there are no limitations when we were brainstorming. Okay. So then we said, who wants to play? All right. Who in the belly of the beast okay, wants to play? All right. And so it was my job to go out and find subs. <laughs> okay. The Exxon campus work was going on, so, so a ton of the construction in industry is already, already doing this. And I have to convince the sub that they want to play by the Living Building Challenge requirements. I got a few hang-ups. I didn't get many callbacks, but I did get some people that wanted to play. Then there was the financing of the project. We had a base budget, and it was beyond that. So we were going to ask for donations because we were the first Living Building Challenge project in Texas. Okay. At the time, Monarch School had a capital campaign going on to finish the rest of their campus. Okay, so we, me, Shelley, and our other um, crazy, Amanda, <laughs> had to ask for all donations. Otherwise, it would get confused with the capital campaign. So all of a sudden, we became fundraisers, too. But we were so, so ready to do this project, we were willing to do that. We had to source materials. Um, finding sources for materials was interesting. Um, it had to be FSC wood. It had to come within a certain region. And there were only two lumber yards in all of Houston that wanted to play, play by those rules. So we did find one that was willing to work with us. And he was great, and we still use him. So just a few little stories about um, kind of, we have this really amazing project, right? Um, a few stories about uh, some of the obstacles. Um, we had to have the plywood come from a certain region. So it comes from uh, Louisiana. So the, the distance was, was within the, the constraints. And when we were ready to sheath the building, I went to pick up the first piece of plywood, and it was stamped, made in Brazil. Even through all those, those obstacles. 
Um, I have to say, Shelley and I often have said this would be a good documentary. A reality TV show. So we did find team players, and all the wood on this building, inside and out, um, was salvaged material. So the outside, um, the, the outside finishes came from this building, which is a beef processing warehouse in Fort Worth, Texas. Okay, that they took down, and they milled the beams into into um, into wood for us. We used pallets because we thought that was fun. So every pallet that came onto the job, every pallet that came onto, the, there was another big building going on the campus at that time. Shall I show you the pictures of it? We took the pallet, right? And then we bought this thing called a pallet buster for 100 bucks. And then we busted up all the pallets. And then the students got involved. They grabbed the pallet slats. They sanded them. They took them to the art department. They painted them. Every single student in that school painted a piece that went on the wall. It was an incredible contribution. And there it is. The parents con contributed, they contributed their wine corks. It's amazing when you ask for stuff, it just shows up. I still have bags of wine corks. <laughs> but this is kind of a, an indication of a piney forest. Okay, so we wanted to get creative and artistic. The studio is a multidisciplinary studio um, that anyone can use on campus. I'll just quickly go through, well, well actually, let me show this real quick. This is a mechanical room right here. It's got a monitor in it that shows what the solar array is bringing in for energy, what the wind turbines bringing in for energy, and the kids are going to run this building. So they're going to know how much energy is coming in and how much they can use. Okay, so maybe someday they might be cold, but they might end up putting a sweater on instead of flipping the switch. Okay, and the building is designed to run in both passive and active modes. So they have that option, and we're finding that it can run in passive mode much more often than what we would have anticipated, which is something that, like I said earlier, is not being done in Houston right now. No one thinks passive mode. So wind turbine, they're gonna they're gonna see how that works. Oh, I'm going to skip this because we're running a little low on time. But that's the wall assembly if anyone wants to know about it. We did a blower door test on it. What did we get? 3.7? 3.7 and ACH 50. Yeah. Um, I'm going to skip that too. Um, here's the south side of the building. And it's got a major overhang over a deck so that it doesn't get too much sun exposure. Okay? There's a dog trot here. Okay, so that we take advantage of prevailing winds that will come across the campus and through the dog trot. And believe me, that dog trot works. I mean, there's a reason that they built them, because they really work. And then we added barn doors, because in the winter, the prevailing winds come from the north, and it's cold. Not cold by Vermont standards, but it's cold, okay? And so we can close barn doors on both sides, to kind of make that a working area. Um, the kids, like I said, the kids are going to run this, this building. And we, we, we um, designed it so that the active system, the mechanical system, is coupled with a passive system. Okay, so like uh, natural ventilation is through the prevailing winds through the dog trough. Okay, or through the stack effect as it comes through these doors and it goes up out the clear story windows on the other side. Okay. The mechanical system is we have an air displacement system that pushes the air out at a low level. Okay. And then the then at a cool temperature, and then the heat exhausts through your head and goes up up up, up into uh, the return. That's just a quick example. Um, and this right here is the catwalk. We added that kind of at last minute. All right, so the kids can go up a ladder, up here, and they can feel what the stack effect is. They can actually feel it on their face. All right, so, so they don't just read it in a book. They'll read it in a book, but then they'll go up there and they'll know that it's happening. Okay? Uh, that's, the, that's kind of the interior of the building. This is a wall. Uh, it's the, the, the building is built into the hill. Um, so this is a thermal mass wall that helps with cooling. 
and that's coupled with our geothermal system, which goes 400 feet into the ground and closed loop. And then that's kids in it for the first time. Assembled for a, a speaker. We got lots of publicity on this thing. We were in the Houston Chronicle a couple times. Gulf Coast Green decided to do their opening night conference there. On Earth Day, every major local TV station was there interviewing not just us, but the kids. You know, it was a major news story. It was amazing. And we're just having a lot of fun with it because the amazing part is just, it's just it's, it's, it hasn't even happened yet. So we're planting seeds. So, uh, so uh, in St. Catharines, Montessori School is uh, also looking to do a living building challenge. We're still planting seeds. Um, I'm going to, because we're low on time, I'm just going to flip through these slides of some of the work that, that we've done with re reused and salvaged materials. So this is just a fence, dress it up. Um, I'm not going to explain this whole thing, but reusing cabinet doors uh, on a ceiling, using glass mosaic, uh, refinishing a bathroom. These are the same cabinets as was in it, but now it has a modern look and they didn't spend any money on cabinets. Same thing with a tool shed. Um, why not have some fun with chairs, right? Okay, so we did a few chairs just, just for the fun of it. Um, a doghouse, people can relate to things sometimes when they're in smaller form. Uh, capturing rainwater, and then another doghouse built a 99% uh, salvage. The only thing we bought was the uh, the fasteners for this doghouse. It's a lucky dog. I don't donated that to a to a cause. Okay, so quickly tending the field. <laughs> so, the field. so that's working at um, kind of the seed level. So we're trying to get buildings out there that plant ideas and and change people's thinking. So I'll try and get through this part of it really quickly. Um, as we were doing our three years. We develop relationships with all of these organizations. And really what this is going to be about is developing this at a larger scale. How do you scale up the kind of transformation that we're trying to do? What I've done in the last two years since then is gotten involved in all of these organizations. So you can see this is a pretty hefty list. What I've also done in the last year is regenerative practitioners training, which is helping to guide us, as did our colleague Amanda, who Shannon referenced earlier, she's an architect and green consultant who was the, was the green consultant on the LBC studio. She's also my co-chair on the AI Houston Committee on the Environment and our new resiliency task force. So we're all kind of the troublemakers in town, but there's a lot of others. Um, and so what we've learned with regenerative practitioners training is what we're working on in order to scale this up is tending the field, basically. How do we get these various organizations interconnected with working relationships. And so this is, I'm going to talk about this quickly on a neighborhood scale and then on a regional scale. So the first thing that happened here, kind of quickly, is that Amanda had a CDC that came out of Phoenix Commotion that we weren't doing anything with, but that was going to be the vehicle for getting into the low-income neighborhoods and working with it. But we wanted a real relationship. We didn't want to swoop in and be the external people saving the day. So we started working with this organization, which has an urban farm in one of the low-income communities. They started this organization, Food Everywhere, which brought together all the urban farmers and all the low-income communities in Houston. It's a pretty, as in most places, this is a pretty active thing. We met a guy named uh, Kelvin Farmer, as we call him, and he introduced us to his neighborhood group, Independent Heights Collaborative Action Coalition. Independent Heights is, was the first black neighborhood to become a municipality in Texas in the early 20th century. Um, it is since it's not too long after it, it, it joined the city of Houston. But it still has that history and many of the descendants of those founders are still there. They started this organization, ICAT, as to bring together all the 501c3s in the neighborhood to give them a stronger voice. So Amanda and I joined this board and they were glad to have us there. They needed a vehicle. They didn't have a CDC. They, most of the other low-income neighborhoods have one. They did not yet. And so we're like, oh, well, we got one. So we put the president <coughs> on the board of Living Paradigm and now a partner. So this is how these relationships start to build and we can start to now do something. So here's where ICAC is. Here's Houston. Here's that inner loop. Here's where, here's where Independence Heights is. Okay. Um, one of the things about Independence Heights is it was founded in, it came out of the Reconstruction period shortly thereafter. The other thing that happened during the Reconstruction in Texas is 
the two first two universities were founded, one white, one black. The black one is called Prairie View a and It's just outside of Houston. Last fall, uh, they needed someone to teach sustainability in their school of architecture, and I said, yep, that's me. Um, the uh, founders of Independence Heights, most of the, many of them were educated at Prairie View. And so the second mayor, for example, and many others. So there's, there's this old relationship between Independence Highs and Prairie View. So I got to thinking. Um, the first thing that I, I'm teaching at Zero Studio there, and this is my class out at the Living Building Challenge Studio this past year. But here's the deal. So here's Prairie View A&M. These are their majors in the School of Architecture, Construction Science, Architecture, Community Development. I work with all of these. So we are going to be using their outreach, which an a and is required to do, community outreach, to work with ICAC's Housing and Community Development Committee, which is being guided by the Regenesis Group, who Amanda and I have trained with. And Amanda also has a relationship with U of H Architecture, and we're using a couple of their researchers to help us document this so we can replicate it. And then here's the three, our three companies that work here. And then by the way, here's ICAC over here. The executive director of Can Do Houston is also a professor at Prairie View and A&M. We are working on joint curriculum to talk about community health in terms of design. So we'll have programs going there. Voila, that's how you start to do this. That's, you know, that's laying the groundwork. Then it gets a little trickier. You gotta get into the regenerative practitioners training and whatnot to, to understand what to do from there. But that, so here's just a couple of things we have going in Independence Heights. This property is owned by the Houston Housing Authority. They recently got it. Um, this is uh, Yale Street Baptist Church. The pastor of that is the president of the Independence Heights Collaborative Action Coalition. This is where Kelvin the Farmer lives and his community garden is right here. So they asked us um, to convey to the housing authority what they would like to see on these properties. They're very, this is a single family neighborhood traditionally, and they're very concerned about the projects arriving in town. And in the meantime, they're missing a lot of community <coughs> infrastructure. So what we're showing here is a business incubator, rec center, um, farmer's market and cafe store, and then other community assembly spaces and probably a library and whatnot. Uh, green, this is all pedestrian. This, uh, the community garden at Kelvin's. This is a parking garage. The um, Yale Street Baptist owns this property, so they're willing to private partnership with them on this to get the parking that's needed. And then everything else is pedestrian bus stops there, there, and there. Bike trail here that goes down the street to the new um, bike rail station. So it's a pretty impressive thing. And now, really, we've got, we didn't know when we met with them that they had an option on that, too. So because they do, um, there's the opportunity to do everything they need to do by mandate and what ICAP wants to do. So what I'm going to be doing this fall with my studio, architecture studio at, at Prairie View, this was done really, really quickly. We're going to fully engage those students to really explore this with the community, these sites, and see what it is they want so that we can then convey that properly to the Houston Housing Authority, who is, well, they have a lot of RFQ out to architects for this project, which I also submitted for with my old company. So, you know, this is how this stuff starts to play out, if you put yourself out there and really start to make these connections. The other idea that we're floating for Independence Heights, I mentioned earlier, I don't, maybe I didn't mention, it's under intense gentrification pressure. So Houston's population, Houston proper, is, is projected to double by 2030. Yeah, so um, what's happening is every nook and cranny is getting filled in. It's densifying a lot of the inner city lots whenever possible are getting subdivided into three and they're building these three-story tall townhome type things where it's a garage on the ground floor and then two living spaces. So it's like suburbia squished in together, no relationship to the street, no interaction, and it's going on everywhere. And I just heard the other day a developer bought a few lots in the height, so it's coming. Um, so what that does, gentrification is always a problem in, in any in neighborhood like this where you can no longer afford to be there. This is an elderly population, so 
They're under really intense pressure. They're going to get priced out. So we're trying to figure this out. Is there another model? Instead of doing that, can we, it's really hard to see that, but can we take even two Independence Heights lots instead of doing the three townhome thingy? Can we do three smaller homes that would be good for an elderly person? You know, these are, or even a you know, young family. So these are like 700 to 800 square feet and keep some open space and have a common building. So you know, that's an idea that we're kind of throwing out there to see is there traction. Would that economically work? Would that be a way that we have to densify in Houston? We know that. But is there a different way to do it than what's happening right now that they can stay, people who live there can stay in the neighborhood? There's also a lot of vacant lots in Independence Heights. So this is about a four acre site. So we can also do this in a larger kind of, you know, Ross Chieftain type pocket neighborhood. And again, this could be any sorts of various demographics. Um, these, how, these sizes range from, you know, a small 160 square foot studio up to a 1200 square foot house community gardens, leave the trees that are there as they are as much as possible community spaces. So we're floating these ideas. We just had a Juneteenth celebration down there where we started to survey people in the neighborhood. Hey, what do you think about this? If you had it, what kind of community amenities would you want? So we're just at the really front end. We won't do anything until there's, we've gotten all stakeholders engaged and, and there's energy behind it within the community. So. We're working with ICAC to figure that out. So back to here, that's the neighborhood look at what we're doing. Um, and there's more to that story, but moving on. Now regional scale. This is what you start to do. And these are just some of the organizations that we've been touching. There's many, many others. So I want to talk about this last one here. Amanda and I have been talking for over a year that there's all these really, I mean, you'd be surprised great minds and great organizations really working cutting edge on a lot of these issues in Houston. But there are these little organizations and so our voices get marginalized. But if you actually hooked them all together and they started working and talking, our voice is much, much louder and larger than what it seems. And besides that, if we work together, we could probably come up with some really amazing things. So, we're doing this, we're working on building network, we're working on building capacity among these groups. And so what happened was we talked about that a year ago, but we didn't do anything, we're too busy. And then there was an idea to have, you know, we have hurricanes, we have issues, so there was an idea to do hurricane disaster kind of committee between architecture, humanity, and committee on the environment. And we still didn't do anything. And then a little over two months ago, our mayor is on the presidential task force for climate change and resiliency, and we got a call, we got a call from her office of sustainability saying, hey, we need recommendations from you. Like, when? Like, tomorrow. And we're like, eh, we're not going to be able to get it done that fast. And we're beating ourselves up because if we had started this, we would have had a brilliant response to that. But she said, all right, there's going to be another round in a month. So can you do that? And we're like, yeah, what do you think about this idea of a resiliency committee? She's like, I love it. We need it. We desperately need it. So we put the call out. And these are the organizations so far <laughs> that came to the table. And there's many, many, many others that we're going to be engaging. But these, look, I mean, this is, these are some high-minded people. <coughs> they, we all got together for um, a charrette to kind of figure out what to tell the president. He can do by executive order. There were certain limitations, so nothing could have to go through Congress. And we did that. You know, it was totally out of order. Like, you know, we should have been, like, done a whole bunch of back research before we're getting to putting recommendations to the president. But, you know, it's like, all right, it's our one-shot deal. So we did it. And many of those recommendations did go forward to the president. But now we're backing up. And here's the guiding idea. Law through. Okay? So most of these people at the table here are what I would call on this front over here. These are the, you know, the game changers. So over here, you would probably have more of the business community, oil companies, for example, whatnot. So here's one thing that came out of that, you know, I think is an easy thing to pass along from regenerative practitioners training, regenerative development, is that the key to this here is what often happens when these two things Everything we do involves these two forces. Whether it's an internal thing for you yourself or it's something you're trying to do in the world, a decision you're trying to make, or something activating, something restraining. 
if there's two organizations, let's say the oil company and the ecological company, and they do this, nothing may happen. It may be business as usual by default, or they may compromise and everybody loses. This happens all the time, all right? So when that happens, our system devolves. So what we want to do is find a way to reconcile. And in actuality, that reconciliation is the very thing that it allows the system to advance to a higher state. That's evolution. Okay, this is how evolution happens. And so we, all of us in Houston, if it's just us ignoring this over here, forget it, game over. We're never going to get there. So we've been very open at the table. We've started both of our meetings saying this is what we're going to do. We don't have these people at the table yet, but we're about to invite them. So get ready. And not only get ready, but realize that if we're going to get to here, the key is over here. So I think that's the most powerful thing that I could actually convey to you about how we need to shift what we're doing in the world. All right. Now that said, um, Shannon's going to finish up here. Um, we are up here in Vermont. We spend our summers here now. This is the first summer we're doing it, and there's a very good reason for that because it's been nonstop down there. And I'm actually still really busy with stuff down there at the moment. But um, we got to pay attention to our being, and I'll be the first person to tell you I am horrible at this. I've been hor I know what to do, but I've been really horrible at it for the last two years. So Shannon's going to talk about this a little bit because this is key. I should have made Shelly talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, here and now, this is on some of this stuff. But um, So tending the being or staying sane, how do we stay sane um, with this story? Rest and relaxation. Um, that is that, a me, I will have you know. That is not a shame. <laughs> that's a key, rest and relaxation. Um, we're playing with our dogs. Uh, they're, they're our masterful teachers, okay? They teach us how to play. They teach us about unconditional love. They teach us how to have fun. Um, so being with our dogs is, is a big deal. Um, we just took up a new hobby, uh, disc golf, and, and we're getting out and we're playing that with friends. Um, and uh, this is really simple stuff, but, but often we're like, we're too busy. We're too busy, right? But if we can take one night a week and do this, we're interacting with people, we're not talking about business, we're not stressed by work, and we're just tending to our own being. Um, being in community, uh, that is a super, super big thing. And again, connecting with nature. So when we get out of Houston to um, go to a conference, we try to do conferences outside of Houston, even outside of Texas, okay? So, um, and, and we take a couple extra days or time during the conference breaks to get out into nature. Um, and we do get into nature in, in Houston, too. I kind of painted a really bleak picture, but there, there are some green spaces in, in Houston. Um, just slowing down enough to appreciate the natural beauty that happens around us all the time, even in the thick of the city. Um, and this is a gorgeous sunset that doesn't show up so great on this screen, but... Um, and that was actually a picture I took. Um, and then... One thing that we've realized as of late is celebrating our successes. So not just when the Living Building Challenge Studio is done, because that took over a year to do, but celebrating the little successes. Okay, the very little things. So if the plywood finally shows up after I've sent it back and I've been on the phone and they contacted Louisiana and it finally shows up and we get to sheet the walls, that's a success, and, and, and we celebrate that. We take time to celebrate. If we don't celebrate, this is what happens, and that's Shelly. Um, uh, so we need to take time just to, just to slow down, um, find the balance between work and play, and, and get up here in the summers and, and enjoy the, the nice Vermont weather. So that's it. So that was a lot.